Je me retourne vers les, les co-créateurs de la technologie Freud. Non, je vous en prie, Amaury. Vous Turning to the co-inventors of the Frogan's technology. No, of course, Amaury. But before I hand over to Amaury, I'd like to give you the floor, Alexi, so that you can tell us about the introduction of Frogan's technology. Dans les prochains, uh, and so that you can tell us about dissemination or spreading, which is going to be carried out within OP3FT and within the internet ecosystem within a few days. On me dit, uh, fait so, I'm told, make this Frogan site disappear. Okay, I didn't say that, but it's very easy. You double click on the Frogan's player and they're gone. Well, they're still here, but they're not in plain view. Bonsoir à tous. Uh, Hello. Good evening. Tonight, I was asked to recap on the few years that just went by, leading to the first introduction of the Frogan's technology on the Internet. So, as an introduction, you all know that this project started a while ago, it started speeding up in 2012 when we set up the OP3FT. In order to make it available to all web surfers throughout the world. And what's interesting is to revisit what occurred over the last few years to try and understand that, yes, we are at a stage where the project can start being active in the world, making a certain number of elements available to people. What's interesting is that since the establishment of OP3FT, we went back to 2013 to try and see where we, we're standing at the moment. So, the project, as described by Amory, is obviously a technological project because that's uh, a publishing technique or technology on the internet, but it goes beyond technical aspects because it involves publishers, web surfers, right holders, and this internet community has significantly grown since it started deploying in the 80s with the web layer. So when you kick in 20 years after the web, you also need to take into account all the issues that emerged. And this is why, before we start going live, along with the different people working on the project, we decided we would use this time available in order to meet with a certain number of players, like players having a major influence in the, on legal aspects, trying to understand the challenges some countries have with regards to accessing the Internet, and providing a response, guaranteeing free access to information and freedom of speech. So, on this map that we're currently presenting, we try to recap everything, or at least part of what was done, and what is visible from the surface. So this graph, if you look at the caption, you realize that there are many circles in different colors. So at the top you have FCR account administrators, those are the people who are in charge of registering Frogan's addresses in the Frogan's call registry. Then you have um, conflict resolution people or dispute resolution people because each time you have an addressing system on the internet and when this system is very open, you're naturally exposed to risk of uh, regist uh, registration abuse. And then any addressing system requires monitoring, and that's performed by other players. So you see, and then you see this yellow, kind of yellow can of beans here, that says FNS server, 
and that's the implementation of the addressing system by the FCR administrator. So they're in charge of um, operating the server for OP3FT. So in mid-2013, we started having some tools, a time schedule. We were talking about introducing the technology to different brands, and we started with a team of legal experts. And moving on to the next slide. So the next year, in mid-2014, we had the gradual rollout of FCR, and three FCR account administrators headquartered in France who played the game by testing out our system in terms of administration and technical aspects. Registration methodologies, working with three accounts administrators, too, who were corporate registration offices, French corporate registrars specializing in offering services to uh, trademark holders. So that was when the system was set up. The following year, in mid 2015, the pace quickens with a large scale test that was launched and we set up a priority registration period for trademark holders so that before uh, it was uh, spread, they could start to register their names in the central, in the core for GANS register. That's for trademarks. So we went from three to 15 FCR account administrators, one in the US and one in Canada. We can see in blue, they are primarily in Europe, in the UK, in Switzerland, and so on. So that was the starting phase. These account administrators were partially consulting firms in intellectual property or law firms working for their clients. In this system we proposed, the FCR account administrator is not necessarily a domain name registration office. It may be a, a law firm or a specialized uh, uh, service provider in publishing content. It's very open, in fact, but we'll come back to that in another presentation. At the same time, we saw the green bubbles appear in one in the US and four in Asia. These are dispute resolution service providers, UDRPFs. UDRPF, that's a charter for dispute resolution written by OP3FT, inspired from the dispute resolution charter apl applied to web domain names. When we wrote it, we adopted the UDRP charter for Forgan addresses. So we approved and signed memorandums of understanding with providers in the United States uh, Forum, previously the National Administration Forum, managing most disputes on the web, well, on web domain names, and also with ADNDRC, which brings together, as you can see, different arbitration centers operating on web domain names. So that was in 2015. These contracts were set up and they were implemented by arbitration centers. If you go to the websites of these organizations today, you can already file a complaint if you own a brand, a trademark, and a registration was made and you consider that you are the legitimate holder. Whereas the person, uh, well, uh, assuming that you were cyber squatted. Each center has its own costs and procedures and must uphold UDRPF, the charter um, drawn up by OP3FT. 
with support from the World Intellectual Property Organization. It was in 2010 that we already started to draft this charter. The third point on this slide in mid-2015 is the emergence of the first FNS servers. One based in Paris, a sort of reference CNS FNS server, and the other based in Frankfurt. If you took part in a previous Forgans Technology Conference, I think it's conference number six. With Lovell, with the level three communications, we presented the deployment plan for the service together with level three. This was the first deployment phase. One year down the road, you can see even more bubbles. We can see the number of FCI account administrators increased even more. If you start with Asia, we see a first bubble in Korea, if I'm not mistaken, followed by two in Africa, and another one in the United States. Clearly, there are others that emerged in Europe. So it's becoming quite difficult to present things, and all the better. But you can see it all on this. This is public data. The source is the website of the FCI operator, fci.forgans, which you can consult with your with the internet. I spoke just a while ago about uh, the data centers in four American data centers, one in Los Angeles and no, two in Los Angeles and two in New York. So two new FNS servers that started operating in mid. 2016, with a resolution of the first four grand addresses that we spoke about at the last of the C. We also saw uh, four grand address watch providers. These are entities in Asia, in several countries in Asia, in Europe, Africa, and the US, where they offer services to watch dot net addresses using public data provided by the FCR operators so that they could track record registrations, enabling the companies to inform their clients if there were any disputes. So that's what has been taking place for the past three years. So things are rolling along smoothly with further responsibilities for us because we will continue to keep this uh, uh, network alive. In the middle of 2017, we may no longer be able uh, to draw this map. If it's not in 2017, maybe in 2018. There were too many points. We had the introduction phase before the possibility of uh, publishing program sites for the public. And as of this new moment, indicators will evolve to keep track of what's taken place. Now, a lot has been done by OP3FT over the past three years, all in all. The environment set up to host this publication system, we think it's the right choice. In other presentations later on, we'll see that a lot has been done in different places, different countries to be in online with needs and users' needs, legislations in the various countries. So that has been done. This doesn't show at all one thing. What's invisible here is all the technical work done by the teams. As I said, that is the tip of the iceberg. But while these little bubbles were emerging, we are working on Forgan's technology tremendously. My colleagues will come to explain more about that later on in greater detail. Fine, so we've set up an environment, it's a good one. 
All these people joining the project did it based on their own initiative. We didn't reach out to them in particular. We proposed these new systems to the internet community, and we saw there was a huge response, even though all these people didn't really see any Frogan's sites or were not able to publish any during that period. So a strong appeal, as we can see, even though the actual spread had not started. Fine. Now the starting point is here. We're coming to the starting line with the publishing of the Frogan sites. Today's conference will try to show to you all the things that are changing. For us, this is a complex moment in time. Even though this introduction led us to meet a lot of people, all of this could be controlled in terms of management, but it will become far more complex with uh, thousands of developers and thousands of sites published. So at OP3FT and uh, the FCR operator now like to be able to keep track of the increase in the number of users. The next point, when you, after covering the, this phase of spreading, how we will we go about spreading programs technology? I can see you nodding your head. How will we do it? <laughs> Good question. Well, we thought about this deeply. All of these uh, trials that others have been working on it helped us to understand where we needed to focus on more, where we should take our time, where it was not necessary to take more time. So we reached a model of activity for OP3FT to spread this technology. Let me show you this slide. Bringing together some of our thoughts about spreading the technology. On this slide, starting from the right, you can see that there are over 3 billion users. Amory said before, at least 170 million websites, or publishers of content, probably far more. And behind that, a technical community with several million developers, designers, agencies. And to the far right, we see OP3FT, about 30 people, and ultimately not 3 million, maybe 300 people, at, at several sites. So of course, it's not symmetrical with the number of web users. So with respect to the spread of this technology, we can do a lot of things at OP3FT. We understand more or less all the stakeholders on the internet, take into account their roles, their needs, and this is why it's a comprehensive environment today. Where we're good, really good, is the technology. We do foreground technology, that's not bad because it's not that simple. There are not many internet layers rolled out on the internet today. We are the only ones for quite some time now. But you must also be able to come back to the fundamentals. We're very good at technology, but when it, it's about inspiring a publisher of content in their context, we may not be bad because we have a few ideas, but we're very bad as compared to specialized agencies or service companies who work on their clients' needs every day. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be in contact with a representative sample of publishers, but we said we must come back to our role, which consists in drawing up specifications and explaining them to people who want to read them. When you look at our specs, they're not much better than the source <coughs> code that Jean Manuel showed you earlier. Well, yes, the source code was in color. Our specs are in black and white. The format corresponds to what the IETF uses for its technical norms. I won't come back to why we did it that way. We already spoke about that. So these are specifications that are very precise, but they're not easily accessed for readers, for, for, for those who'd like to build a site quickly. 
At the same time, developers need to work in their own language. You're here, we are in France with developers who are French around us. Most of them are happy when they receive a manual in French, even, they, even though they can more or less read in English because there's a lot of English um, in technology on the internet. But it's better to use your own language. Also, when they go to China, people are happy to read in Chinese. If you multiply all of that, that's far too much work for a team of 30 today. Which probably brings us back to an interesting need to refocus on a certain population, as we indicated here, clubs of developers, developers' clubs, meaning places or sites that are administered by developers primarily, and their job is to present technologies and to make them accessible. They are like mediators. They already exist. They do that for the web. A lot of developers develop tutorials for other people on how to do HTML, how to use CSS, how to do JavaScript, or even how to make a dynamic websites using PHP. So all of these people have the real ability to understand technical specifications and to make objects that are easy to use with advice for users, with examples, simulations. They even go further than that, mm -hmm. making videos, uh, meeting others to explain, and they do that locally in their own language with a talent that is quite obvious on the internet. All it takes if you want to know exactly what I'm talking about, look for tutorial HTML or tutorial CSS using your search engine, and you'll find a lot of very interesting sites that are very well done. So the approach is simple, to come into contact with some of these developers' clubs, and those who would like to work more on their own to try to make FSDL uh, easier to read in their community, we will help them to do that work, but without doing it for them. Because our vision of things is that, of course, you shouldn't do work for others, you do what you can do. What we can do, and do very well, is technology. And I think we're probably the only ones to be able to make this type of technology today with the demands that Amory spoke of earlier. So that's what we'll be doing. This chart indicates our wager, which is uh, less of a wager than a reality, I'm sure. But we know that the developers of the section in the middle, the 18 million, these are people who regularly consult their knowledge base if they find in their knowledge bases a tutorial on Forgans, fine. They will be interested because developers are curious people. Most of them love what they do. If they have a new technology in front of them, they try it out because especially as it's free and there is uh, nothing to fear. They quickly identify that if it's for free, well, it's not a proprietary technology, not something that will uh, change the terms in two years' time. So all of that is quite nice. And there are many challenges, though, for these developers in using programs technology, making sites. You can see it's very graphical. Jack Daniel showed us sites that are made by designers and that are extremely well done. And there are many more uh, experiments that can be done in interaction with programs websites which will create a lot of, generate a lot of creativity. You have dynamic sites to be made, sites that are generated uh, during browsing on the fly. And all of these challenges, well, the entire technical community will rise to those challenges for them to know Frogans. The best thing is for them to meet it, meet Frogans technology with the normal go. I think the budget that Amory spoke of will not enable, well, I think it would be ludicrous because it would be a big waste to start communication 
exercises to make the technology known through advertising. I think that we'll be getting it totally wrong. So these developers, I'm talking about the 18 million on this chart, and that's an approximate figure, so rough figure, just to give you an order of magnitude. Well, they themselves will make some small foreground sites, having fun showing objects, publishing them to compare. That's the good thing of having an addressing system so that they can quickly show their sites, doing their promotions on uh, social media. Well, address is a wonderful way to communicate for people who make sites. And uh, they will probably very quickly inspire uh, publishers of content based on their demonstrations. Publishers of content don't make sites to keep them at home, but to show them, to promote them amongst their users. So th these are the green arrows on this chart. The yellow arrows on this chart relate to common phenomena, not in terms of mimetism, but an influence amongst peers. If I'm a developer, and I see my friend, a developer, doing a bit of FSDL, I'll check it out to see what it is doing. And if I find it nice, and I think I'll find it very nice, I too will do a little bit of it. So that is it for the strengths that will push in favor of this spread. The internet and publishing content, of course, it's about business. You see a lot of... Uh, big players making a lot of money from the internet in general. But at the same time, for many users, probably a half, it's a space of creativity, a place for passion, where you do things that are not only for money or only for selling. There are lots of things that are done for fun on the internet. Present the things that you find exciting to present or exchange ideas and data. And all of that, an important way of spreading. Maybe one of the number one way of spreading as far as we are concerned. So that's what I had to tell you about the, an overview of the introduction of this technology. Thank you so much, Alexei. Alexei, briefly. I have a question for you, and uh, as a matter of fact, if you have any questions in the room, Alex, Alexander is in the corner. If you're on social media, you too can ask your questions that will be sent up to me and that I'll put to our speakers. Alexi, you spoke about developers' clubs. People are making tutorials. You spoke about developers for HTML and CSS. I was wondering, would you also contact developers' clubs in other types of technology than uh, publishing content, but more software and software developers, or developers on servers, for example? Yes. Let me point out that I spoke about what will probably be done online. Because the developers we're talking about here are people who can be contacted on the network, not necessarily people who you would meet. But Philip later on will explain other approaches as regards additional communication. To answer your question about other populations in this development environment, of course, as you said, you have all of these skills around creating sites. And that's the top end, designers and communication agencies. You have people who do software development, who will develop dynamic foreground sites. And at the bottom of this chart, you also have software developers. Software developers in this environment are people who will make authoring tools software that will help, well, the first on the list here, to more easily, uh, for example, designers may more easily make their foreground sites. So indeed, through these uh, sites or these uh, intermediate players, 
uh, developers' clubs, as we refer to them, we'll also be speaking to these communities of developers who make software much more so than sites. Thank you, Alexei.